Aerial down. Tell me if we go live again, will you? Mm, I might be live. I'm sure it's live, but I mean sound-wise. Bid my anxious fear subside, death of death and hell's destruction. Land me safe on death and side. Strong deliver, strong deliver. We're not live, are we? Yes, we are. You're joking. <laughs> you must be. I need that sound again. OK. Right, we've got sound again. I hope you um, missed my little song there. Right. I'm not sure how much of that you lost or how much you got or how much you missed, but it is the morning. It is South Africa. It's a glorious morning. 21.9 degrees of millimeter, millimeters of rain fell from the sky last night, have wetted the earth. Let's go and see what we can find out there. As I say, you're on a live safari. Send us questions. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Questions at wildearth.tv. If you're on the email, talk to us on the YouTube stream. Ask us about Africa. Ask us about South Africa. And we'll Love, we'd love to talk to you over the course of the next three hours. It's 25 degrees Celsius out here, 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And you're in for a treat, of course, during the course of the morning, because I am not alone out here, oh no. Uh, on the other vehicle, we have making his world premiere, Sam Chevalier, and he is being filmed and hopefully directed around the reserve by Brian. They may be taking most of their game drive from the Western Kruger National Park, uh, owing to the fact that Sam hasn't driven around this area and Brian has a rather interesting sense of humor, but we'll keep you posted on that. And in the final control, we have got Kirsten on the vocals and Nikki Austin typing the keys. This is the northern boundary and our plan is to head off east towards the edge. And what we're going to do is have a look to see if we can find, perhaps, the lions that were on Torchwood Road, at least on Torchwood yesterday, eating a buffalo. Thank you to all of you for letting us know that the sound wasn't working initially. I'm not sure how much of my initial waffle you missed. Uh, you got the second round. And now, ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, let us head across for the world premiere. Please be nice to the fellow of Sam Chevalier. I will see you shortly. Hello everyone, we're here in the Sabi Sands with the Warburg's Eagle just above us in its nest on what I'm just being told is Warburg's Road. Um, how exciting to start my morning with uh, Safari Live with the Warburg's Eagle. We can tell it's a Warburg's Eagle because of its crest on top of it. Hello everyone, my name is Sam, I am from Cape Town. Uh, thank you for allowing me to talk to you all from all over the world. It's a very exciting day for me, I must say. I've never ever been on camera like this uh, to everyone in the world, so it's really good to meet you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm from Cape Town. Um, I studied uh, at Stellenbosch University, Development and the Environment. I became very, very passionate about the bush, and, and so I decided to go and experience the bush a couple of years ago. Um, and I've been traveling for a long time since then, and I've just arrived back in the bush. So not only is this the first experience for me in the vehicle with a camera pointing in my face, but it's also a first time being back in the vehicle, being back in the bush, and to experience this wilderness. So thank you so much for being a part of my first experience in the bush. As you can see, I'm actually s slightly shaky, as this is just so weird and amazing at the same time. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna head. Oh, there goes the Warburgs. Thank you very much for uh, for being my first sighting on the wild safari. safari. Uh, we're gonna head off in this direction. Are you guys ready to follow me on this trip? Let me just see if I can get All right. See if I can get this immobilizer to work. We, we are on our way. So, 
if you guys have any questions for me to help me along my my trip here obviously i do not know the roads around here i hardly know the animals i was just on drive yesterday what was so exciting about last night is that i had to do a rain dance uh, that was also quite nerve nerve-wracking um, but you know what that created i think it created some rain um, we saw quite a bit of rain last night which was which was hugely exciting and I lay in my bed just yo, so excited to just be out in the bush this morning to see what has come of the rain. You know, maybe we'll see some frogs. Maybe we'll see a few other animals that the, that the animal, that the, which animals enjoy the water. Um, so let's take an eye out. So if you have any questions or queries, please, uh, yes. Um, if you have any questions or Corin, uh, what is my favorite animal? That's a great question. Huh? You know, I've, I've had the, the privilege of experiencing many ecosystems over the last two years, from, from the Amazon River to the Pantanal to the Cedarberg Mountains. And I would have to say, my time in the Cedarberg Mountains, which is just north of Cape Town, I spent many, many hours with a black eagle, the red eagle. I used to sit underneath its nest and watch its babies feed. And there was just many, many moments sp spent with that black eagle that I'll cherish for the rest of my life. Um, but that was, yeah, that's my number one eagle. So thank you. Natasha, uh, nice to hear from you. Thanks for welcoming me to this, this new day in the Sabi Sands. Um, well, we've just seen a Wahlberg's eagle, which was fantastic. Um, at the moment, we're going to be heading, and I'm hoping to see maybe in, in Nyala, because I also really enjoy the Nyalas. I know that they're quite secretive animals, and they enjoy being in the thickets. So this is actually our best chance of seeing in Nyala. But of course, I would love to see some of the, the bigger animals like the elephants. Yeah. To be honest, I, I'm just quite excited to see any, anything with you. So thank you for asking, Natasha. Can you imagine how these trees are feeling with the, the rain last night? the angel lady um, thank you very much I'm glad you enjoyed that dance I must say uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that dance um, I can't say I've ever done something of the sorts in my life but if it did something for the rain because it quite clearly made some rain last night then I'm very happy to do it again one day um, it was very exhilarating you know being on camera for the first time and trying to dance in front of a whole bunch of people is not an easy thing to just go about doing. But I wouldn't say I was a natural in that way. Ooh. Guys, I'm going to need some help going through these roads. I have absolutely no idea where I'm going. So to make it easier for me, please can you hashtag Safari Live and give me some updates maybe on where I should go and how I should move. But it seems that we've just come into a river basin and you know what we can find? What we can find in a river basin is leopards, as I said, the Inyata. I'll never forget once, I was just driving through a riverbed like this and a, and a bush buck was sitting just in the, in the riverbed and a, and a leopard came and, and took it. It was the most incredible experience. I didn't expect it at all. And it was one of my first sightings of a, of a kill. It was in the late evening as well. So you could just see the silhouette of that leopard catching that bush buck. Incredible experiences here in the Sabi Sands. Ooh. 
Did you see that, guys? How exciting is this? How... How exciting was that? From the Wahlberg's eagle to a hyena that just came and saw. Do you think he came and supported me in this morning? I think so. <laughs> wow, what a pleasure, hey? That was fun. Ooh. So we've seen a Wahlberg's and we've seen a hyena. An exciting morning, to say the least. I think everyone's up and about because it's been raining. Let's see what other incredible creatures of this earth that we can find on this beautiful morning. As you can see, there's gonna be a beautiful sunrise just over there. Just as, oh, we got some running in parlor. Beautiful. From what I can see, it's a batch, bachelors hanging out together, browsing. Beautiful, beautiful specimens. But uh, just going back to Dr. Debbie, I really hope that I'll be able to find you an elephant. So Elephant, giraffe, or zebra? All right, Dr. Debbie, I've got that on, on my mind, and I'm gonna try and do that for you. So we're gonna leave you, Impala. Thank you for being my third animal of the day. I'm gonna do my very best, Dr. Debbie. So thank you very much, everyone, for being part of that first experience of being in front of the camera. It's been very exciting. And um, we're going to be linking back to James, who is with a zebra. Enjoy. Look at this wonderful herd of striped horses here drinking from a pan filled with new rainwater. It is a joyous time out here for these herbivores. This looks like one kinship group, two foals, you can see two little ones born to two different mares, and they will be the wives of the stallion of this kinship group. And Deborah, you were wanting some zebra. Well, here they are on demand. I'm glad we could oblige you so quickly during the course of the drive. Thank you, everyone, for your kind words to Sam. He seems to be having a good time, which is excellent. Now, I did see, I know I've made quite a lot of mention of the fact that I didn't think the zebras were having a particularly tough time just yet, and how you can tell because their manes start to flop down. I did see a picture of a zebra in the Kruger Park yesterday with a very floppy mane, and still they maintain that kind of fat look about them. So it's really the size of their bellies is a very poor indicator of their condition. These ones are okay, they're still fine, but you can still see that there's no grass for them to eat. They'll be drinking some fresh water, but they will be picking up the odd shoot that has already sprouted out of the ground. And as we drive along, I'll point at those out to you. I've seen some saplings, some little sap tree saplings. They've come out of nowhere. I don't know if they were just lying on the ground before. They couldn't have sprouted during the night, I really don't think. And we've seen lots of the um, that baboon's tail plant, which has been a, just a plain browny gray, is now turned a sort of yellow and is greening already, despite the fact that there's been no sun, even, um, you know, no sun since we had this rain. So it's just all rather exciting. Still, though, if I'm silent for the next 10 seconds, you'll notice how the morning is pretty silent. Just a few drongos calling. A chagra. A 
and a grey hornbill in the distance. Plaintive call. Let's hope we have another few days of rain like this. I think it's going to make a huge difference to, you know, how the animals are going to cope going into the dry season. But look at that standing water. Isn't that nice? We haven't seen that sort of standing water for a very long time. I think maybe this section of the reserve got a little bit more rain than we did. We're not far away from where we live, of course, and where the weather gauge is. But the rain has been so isolated this year that it's quite possible that despite the fact that we're probably only about three kilometers from, as the crow flies from where we live, it's quite possible that this area got a little bit more rain than we did. There are lots more zebra on the road behind, in the bush behind us. Beautiful. It's very peaceful out here this morning, I must say. There's a, a feeling of relief and it's not so much kind of excitement as it is just genuine relief. Now, Monsieur Chevalier seems to have find you, found you an exciting bird. Let's go and across to him before it migrates. Welcome back, everyone. We are here with a red back shrike, otherwise known as the Zorro bird. Can you see? If you, the reason why it's called a Zorro bird is the way which I learned it when I first came to the bush, is if you can see just that little black part by, by the eye, you can see it's almost like a mask that, that the red back shrike's wearing. Um, and that's the, the way in which I, I identified my first red, red back shrike. So this is exciting. This is hell of a, very exciting for me to, to be back with a red back shrike. You often find them in these clumps and it's sitting in a termite mound right here. Beautiful. Is this a uh, first for anyone on the bird list? I would love to know. Please tweet in if this is one of your first sightings of a red back shrike. Well, everyone, let me just show you quickly the red back shrike, otherwise known as the um, Zorro bird, and I have this this device with me, which is fairly new, and I can't say that I know how it works. I have no idea. I've had it for about two years. My stepmother gave it to me. Her name's Michaela, and basically, you just put this device on the picture. What it's supposed to do <laughs> is you put this device on the picture, and it makes a noise, and it's just incredible. I mean, it's a piece of paper that then does it. I mean, we could do it for the lesser grey. Well, it doesn't seem to be working. Maybe it's out of battery, but I can tell you that it's a one incredible book, this, where you could just start learning your birds and hearing their sound calls. It makes it much more of a holistic experience when you can see the colors and the shape of the bird, the beak, as well as listening to that beautiful radiant call that each bird has. So I highly recommend this if, you, if you're looking to further your studies in birding. Anyway, with that, we're gonna carry on. And uh, Dr. Debbie, I haven't forgotten about you. I'm gonna see if I can find a giraffe or, a, or an elephant, or well, I think it was a ze zebra as well. And we're gonna head. <laughs> So remember that this is an immo immobilizer. So. All right, guys, so that was the red back strike. We're gonna be linking back to James now. Have a great time and see you just now. So we've made it across to the cheetah cut line, the eastern boundary of Juma. And you can see there's not a great hive of activity on the road, but at least the road is clear of any kind of, um, well, it's clear of old tracks, which means that we'll see new tracks. Now, in there, the Inkohuma pride was seen yesterday. They killed a buffalo cow and, unfortunately, her fetus, and also two Birmingham boys were with them. And there, I think there were another two Birminghams lurking around. Certainly, there was one at Ancora to the south. 
So we're going to drive down here slowly, see if any of them have come across, and we'll also go and have a look at Biffles Hook water hole to see if any water has filled up there. Wonderful, wonderful topic for discussion. Vincent, you're in Ohio and you say you've recently seen a video of a Kruger Park leopard not eating but mothering a young impala lamb. And you want to know what I think of this behavior and, you know, what's the story? I'd, I don't know really what to think of it other than to say it's not that uncommon. I've certainly seen a lot of footage of lions with oryx and there was a very famous incident of a lioness who adopted, I think it was five or six different oryx uh, calves away from their mothers. So she didn't kill the mothers, she just took them away from the mothers and mothered them. I've seen a leopardess with a baboon before, baby baboon. And I think it is a, it's some kind of transference of that motherly instinct. Certainly, when we hear children mewling, when we hear children crying as adult human beings, and normally it's more with women than it is with men, but we certainly do feel an outpouring of emotion and a, a need to comfort. And somehow, and we don't understand it properly, that I believe exists in many of the animals out here. I think it exists uh, sort of within it's exactly the same, I think, as if when we hear a crying animal, um, even, you know, not a crying baby, if we hear a, a distressed puppy or a distressed cat or even a distressed lamb, our immediate reaction is to try and mother that creature and comfort it. And for some reason, there are some animals who have that heightened sense of emotion that they are able to kind of cross over that species and predator-prey barrier and want to give comfort. I think it's fascinating. I also think that if you watch the situation for long enough, you'd eventually find that that leopard ate the impala. And I think that's what happened with the lioness and her oryx youngsters, which is perfectly normal, of course. So I think that the instinct to mother and the instinct, the emotional attachment to, the emotional det attachment to distress, yeah, it goes quite deep within the mammal psyche. I think it's fascinating to discuss. Thank you for that, Vincent. Let's head across to Sam. He's actually found a heartbeat, which is excellent. Welcome back, everyone. Ooh, that wasn't a very good sound. Can you see the warthogs here, guys? This is so great. So good to see that they're by the water. Can you imagine how thirsty they've been over the last couple couple of months? And now there's the pools are starting to fill up, and they're coming to play in their in the water holes that they've missed for a long time. I think. How exciting to be back with the warthogs! So that's, yo. Oh, I feel like I've seen quite a lot this morning already. Birds. Oh no, where are you off to? Yes. Hi there, Mike in Florida. Uh, it rained very hard last night and it was for a good period of time. It must have been about two to four hours of rain. So I fell asleep at one point while it was raining. So it must have kept on going. Uh, but it was incredible to be, to be in that. It was really, really hard. I think we had about 18 millimeters within like, like one hour or something. Um, so it was great. And, uh, you know, if it was because of the handstand, um, th thank you, Mike from Florida, who said that you enjoyed that handstand. I, I thoroughly enjoy doing handstands, and, and often when I'm feeling a little bit awkward or I just get on my hands, I can't, I can't really tell you why. I just like to get on my hands. Uh, so that was great. So, so thanks, thank you for James for, for bringing me out of my, my head and onto my hands. It was great. Um, anyway, we're going to carry on. Um, I'm going to say thank you to those warthogs. They've been brilliant for us this morning and 
much like all the other animals that we've seen so far. They've been so good for me. And uh, hopefully, Debbie, I'm still looking for those an animals and we'll see what we can do. Let's head off. Immobilizer. Alice in Ohio. Um, I have, you know what? I actually saw the hyena den while I was packing my bag in Cape Town. Um, I just put on live safari the other night and I was watching the hyena den, James and Scott. It was what a privilege, firstly, to be, to be with James and Scott. They've already taught me so much about this area. And I was sitting and, you know, packing my bags and I watched the whole, the whole show of how those hyenas were, were chased into their den by those lions. So I've only actually seen the den uh, virtually. I haven't actually experienced the den. I've seen a number of the uh, hyenas, but I'm sure I'll get to see them soon enough. I'd love to. But at the moment, I actually don't know where I am. I could be anywhere right now. Hopefully. You know, Brian's not taking me to some other property, um, and uh, some other landowner's going to be quite angry with me. But I'm trusting him on my first drive. And as I said again, if you know where, you, where I am, please will you help me? <laughs> I can't... Yes? Was that Pat in Florida? I think it was Pat. If I heard clear, uh, oh, Cat. Cat in Florida. You know, I've had many, many, many uh, experiences that I can really recall, but one that sticks out the most for me is my time when I was at Londo Lozzi. I trained to become a game ranger at Londo Lozzi. It was an incredible, incredible time of my life. I had never, ever spent any time in the bush, and um, I came straight to London Lozzi and, and my world was blown. I started to, the reason I went to the bush is because I wanted to learn about the, you know, the intelligence of ecosystems and how, how much we, we can really learn from nature. It was something that I was trying to find. And anyway, to get to your point, I was, went, we had to do these long walks uh, for seven days around the reserve um, and hot, hot days walking on my own. And the one day I was, I had my backpack on and I was walking, it was about eight o'clock in the morning and I wasn't allowed to be seen by anyone. And um, a good friend of mine, James Tyrrell, was out on drive and I couldn't be seen by him. I started to hide in the bushes uh, below where he was. Uh, but I knew that his tracker knew that I was there somewhere. But um, I managed to hide quite well. And while I was hiding, I saw, I walked, onto the road and I came across cheetah tracks. And wow, I hadn't even seen, like I think I'd seen cheetah just a couple times um, at Londolozi. And I carried on walking and I went around the corner and two cheetah were sitting up on a, on a termite mound there. And they hadn't seen me yet. And it was just, it was just such an unreal experience, you know, sitting down, or well, not sitting down, standing behind a bush, very, very, um, actually, I felt a lot of love, actually. I, I remember just watching them looking over the, over the savannah, and all of a sudden, they just, um, they just saw me, and they just looked at me, and I took a few steps backwards, and they just carried on standing or lying down on the termite mound, looking over into the savannah. It was just an unreal experience for me to, to have spent time with those, those cheetah, but eventually, I called in on the radio and people came and saw the sighting. So that is probably my number one experience, just because I didn't even know why they didn't run away from me, because normally they're very skittish on foot. If you come across cheetah, they will run. And it was just amazing that it didn't run away from me. And um, yeah, so I highly value that experience in my life. And I would say that that is my number one. Anyway, Brian, 
again. Timby, this hat is one very lucky hat. It's the first hat I ever bought a couple of years ago. You can see that it's it's been through been through quite a lot of wear and tear. And um, I bought it when I first arrived at London Lozzi in 20, 2014. And it has been my best friend since then. It's been on the Amazon River with me. It's been in the Pantanal while I was uh, tracking Jaguar. Um, it's, been, it's been in England while I was doing my masters there. So it's been with me everywhere. And I, I genuinely put it on my head this morning so that I could have a little bit of luck. Um, oof, wow, guys, let's just take in that sighting. It's such, it's so incredible to be back in the Saabi Sands. Huh? Like, as much as, you know, the, it's such a rush being in front of a camera for the first time, especially doing it live. But just to be back in this wilderness and to be back into this, this place that has taught me so much in my life, it's just so great. It's just so, so, so great. And I'm, I'm so grateful to whoever's watching right now to be witnessing these first moments with me in Juva, Game Reserve. Beautiful, beautiful scenes. All, all right, guys, we're going to be linking back to James. Thank you for your questions. I've enjoyed telling some of my stories, and we'll see you just now. Now, for those of you who are regular viewers who've been coming down to this waterhole for the last, well, I don't know how many years, and have noticed that for the first time in 20 years, it dried out this year. Look at what has happened here at Biffleshook Waterhole. I'm not sure exactly where all the water came from. Well, I am. It came from the sky, obviously. But I don't think it came down the drainage line that feeds this dam. I think it probably came from various runoff sites throughout the dam, which you can see. You can see various sites where water's run in here. And the clay in the dam has expanded. That's because, if you happen to be interested in the chemistry of it, a lot of the chemicals within that clay would have gone into solution, and they start basically repelling each other. The ions in, that, in those minerals start to repel each other in the same way that a, a, a magnet would repel a magnet of similar, similar polarity. And that, all of those millions and trillions of ions repel each other, and so the clay expands. You can see it's got all soft. Birds are enjoying it. There's some red-billed buffalo weavers, which I haven't seen here for a long time, suddenly starting to build their nests again. There's a black, blacksmith lapwing knocking about. Can you see the blacksmith lapwing over there? The woodland kingfisher is naturally shouting its head off, but they don't stop doing that, of course. I just wanted to see, we were, I asked, was asking VM if he thought there might be some catfish who had already come out of the mud. That would be very interesting to see. I think there might be in VM. Can you see that, that bubbling there? Mm. Let's see what that is. It's a terrapin. Is it a terrapin? I guess it, I don't know. reckons a terrapin. Also, though, would have come out of an Easterbating state. So it could be a terrapin. They also will hide in the mud and estivate when it is dry. This is just amazing. So I'm not sure how long this water will last, but probably a week or two, I would think, if it doesn't rain again. But if it does rain, obviously a bit more. Ooh. There's even a sandpiper that's come through. How on earth? And you see, it's just, it's just down there to the right-hand side. I can't actually see it anymore, Vim. There was a there was a little sandpiper there, there. Um, no, I don't know how to describe it. It's in front of those two dead logs the other side. It's just walking down there. Can you see it? Got it, yes. Well done. That looks like a common sandpiper, everyone. And a common sandpiper, how on earth that thing found this water during the course of the night, I cannot imagine. Yeah, 
Facebook. Okay, social media. Well, not Twitter for a bird, Viam. <laughs> mm, Twitter is... I don't know. It's not a common sandpiper at all. I think it's that wood sandpiper that came through here earlier the, in the year. Brilliant. How fantastic it is to see this water after... I mean, it felt like quite a lot of rain, but I certainly didn't expect to find this. I expected to find a very small puddle here. But maybe, like I say, this part of the reserve received a bit more rain than we did where we live. OK, well, there's nothing in the way of enormous animals here, so let's carry on and have a look at the sunrise. Anna Marie, you say you feel refreshed just looking at the water in these pans. Yes, so do we. I can't tell you, it's like a new voyage of discovery going out here today. It's wonderful. It really just does add an extra element of joy to the whole experience. But again, a still a very subdued dawn chorus, not much shouting from the birds. But I think that the grass will flush. Certainly after 20 millimeters, it should flush. And I mean, you can get a grass flush even in the winter if you have some rain. So it's possible that, that it will flush. I don't know how many of the seeds will take off. Look at this thing here. This is, I'm sure, also a result of the rain. flying caterpillar. <laughs> now that caterpillar, everybody, has probably come, well, it must have come, from underneath the bark of the dead knobthorn tree under which we parked. And it will be slowly lowering itself down to the ground on a thread of silk. Either that or it's fallen out and manages perhaps climbing back up. I'm not sure what it's doing. <laughs> but if it hangs around like that, it is not going to be long before a forktail drongo or a cuckoo or something like that comes through and chops it. How amazing is that? Looks like he's doing a bit of a jig, don't you think? Yeah? A worm jig. Mm. Mm. He's obviously terrified by us. Let's carry on. We don't want to terrify the caterpillar, everyone. Did you? Was it a terrifying experience? Yeah, it was silkworms. It was silkworms. They charged you. It's a shame, VM. That must have been very traumatic. It would explain why you're such a quiet person. Often a severe trauma like that can make someone quiet. I don't know if you have this tradition in other parts of the world, but in South Africa, often sort of in the springtime, kids would collect and then sort of keep silkworms in a box and they'd feed them mulberry leaves. Um, and then inevitably the silkworms would make cocoons and become moths. Uh, you'd toss them all away once the cocoons were there and the eggs were there. And normally that would be the end of it. And somehow somebody came up with more silkworms next year, and that's how it was. Now look at this. Uh, Monsieur Chevalier is uh, making his way to Bufflesville Dam. Hello. Hello, Mr. Henry. How are you? Very well. Thanks. Good. We have not received any stage fright, I believe. Yeah, it was a little bit of stage fright, but nothing that's, that's going to kill me. Oh, good. Yes, yeah. as Boris Becker said. <laughs> Let us not forget. Hello, Brian. Hello, James. You haven't got him lost yet. No, not yet. Oh, well as, done. As you can see, we are on... You're on your way to, um, to Treehouse Dam. Well done. Okay. There's some, a lot of water in there. There is. Go and have a look. It'll be very interesting. Yeah. OK. See you guys See you on. on. Goodbye, Brian. Marvellous. <laughs> this is wonderful. I, Eric, I absolutely agree with you. You say that you can learn a lot about a place just by looking at maps. 
I agree completely. I love to look at maps of areas. There was just a really nice picture there, sorry, of a woodland kingfisher, but it's flown off. Um, Eric, you say you've obviously studied a map of this area, and there are many times that you've seen the word sprite attached to the end of a word. And if you go anywhere near the Free State, you'll see the word fontaine at the end of a lot of words. Now, sprite is a small river, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, well, that is correct. Uh, sprite is a small river, so hut sprite would have been named for the hut stream, if you like. It's a, a hut is a hat, the hat stream. Um, I'm not sure if that river actually exists anymore. Well, I'm sure it does, but I don't know that anybody's bothered to take note of where it is. So Spreit is a river, so you'll find lots of places named Spreit after Narbuam Spreit, for example. Hood Spreit. Can you think of any other Spreits? Yeah. Null Spreit. Many, many. And then in the Free State, Fontaine, which is a fountain or spring, Bloemfontein. Twee buffels met een kwil doet geschiet fontein. Yeah? Did you know that, everybody? That's the longest place name in South Africa. Twee buffels met een kwil met een squirt doet geschiet. So that means two buffalo with one shot dead made fountain. Sorry, Kirsten, I think I missed that. Can you go again? Tweel, tweel buffels met een squirt fontein. Thank you, Carol. You're taking us nostalgically back to when I did my first drive with VM. And you say, I, I grinned like a pirate. Arr! I'm not sure how a pirate grins, Carol, but thank you. I was with the Inkahuma Pride, so I had it extremely easily on my first drive. I didn't have to look for anything. They just killed a buffalo just next to the camp. It was very easy for me. And as with Sam, I'm sure you'll... Well, as, with, as you were with me, I'm sure you're being very kind, Sam. It is a fascinating experience doing what we're doing for the first time. Now, Debbie, you're asking about lion tracks and if there have been any sighted. No, not at the stage, Debbie. Um, you say it's exciting that the Birmingham boys are in the vicinity. It is, but they come off and onto Torchwood and then they disappear back south again. And I don't understand why it is that they don't come onto this particular piece of land. It doesn't make sense to me, except to say that there is no pressure for them coming from the south. So they obviously see this land as completely sort of safe. I also think the Inkuhumas have not spent a huge amount of time here over the last little while. And that could be one of the reasons why the Birminghams feel no reason to be on Juma itself. So whether we'll see them or not, I don't know. I hope so. Maybe now that there's a little bit more water, we'll attract a couple more buffalo herds here. Now, this is fascinating. Look over here, Vim. Yesterday, these are these baboons' tails that I was telling you about yesterday. They were plain. Sorry, I was just hoping that might be an update for here, but it isn't. These were plain brown. There was no yellow, there was no color to them at all. Those leaves were flopping on the ground. And in the space of less than 24 hours, less than 12 hours, they have suddenly sprouted to life. And I think that by the end of the day, they will probably be green. And with any luck, they'll produce some more flowers. They produce the most beautiful purple flowers. And that's called the baboon's tail, or zero fighter retinervus. Let's head across to Sam now. I think he's probably at the water. Let's get his impressions of it. And I'm gonna continue down here, searching for lion tracks. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I just thought I would be, it would be pleasant for me to bring a little bit about my passion into, into guiding and, and why I am so enthralled by the natural world. Um, here we're sitting with a termite mound. 
and I'm sure you guys have spent much time with James and Scott with termite mounds. But uh, to be, you know, to be honest, the termite mound was one of the first designs that I ever met when I was at college that intrigued me about how clever and genius na nature really is, you know. Um, biomimicry, which is the study of the natural world um, and how we can use the designs of nature within human designs to make our design uh, more efficient is something that I've been ex extremely, extremely interested in. Um, if you have any questions on what really biomimicry is, and if you would like me to explain it a little better, I will do so. Just please tweet in and we can have a chat about it. But over here, there's actually a building in Harare called the, called the Eastgate Mall, which is built on the design of a termite mound, which is which is, allows it to have air, like good cooling. They have like a natural air conditioning. Uh, imagine that, a natural air conditioning in this termite mound. And the reason why they have this is because they've got a fungus that they're trying to, to regulate at the same temperature. So they're actually trying to regulate the, temp the temperature at around 32 degrees Celsius. And, um, and so they build these big mounds and they create uh, the structure in such a way that it creates airflow to come in and regulate that temperature at 32 degrees Celsius. So if you look up the Eastgate Moor in Harare, you'll see that that design of that building has been mimicked from a termite mound. I mean, how incredible is that? Um, and it's, it's amazing. We're only starting to really realize the genius and the intelligence of the natural world. Well, I'm sure a lot of these our viewers know that, but it's something that I have been questioning only since I left school, so for about four years. And, and that's why I went and studied um, ecological design and biomimicry and, and how we can begin to learn about the natural world. So I'm hoping if I do get this position in this interview that I can share some of those things and those experiences that I've had studying overseas in England and uh, spending time in the Amazon learning more about different other designs. And uh, yeah, so um, hopefully we can share a lot more. And I'd love to hear about your stories and your experiences. and. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Alistair. My masters I just completed at the end of last year. It was it was in ecological design thinking at a college in the south of England called Schumacher College in Devon. And ecological design thinking it's a very very new uh, like masters to do. I don't think. Many people have done that. Um, I know for sure that I'm one of the only people in Africa that has that masters. Um, so I don't really know what it is at the moment, but the, the, you know, it's still very alive in me and what ecological design thinking is. And it was about learning about the natural world and trying to understand how it's connected to our cities and how we can connect it to social systems. And so that's that's what my my masters in, and that the, that that would that was what the question was about. Is is, yeah, what my master's was in. So if you have any other questions around that, please let me know and tweet it in. Anyway, let's go and find an animal. Let's go and find an elephant or a giraffe or a zebra. I know, Debbie, if you're still watching, I'm gonna try and do that for you. Mobilizer. Can remember these little things. Sabrina, so great to have you on, on uh, live TV right now. Um, I was 23, 23 years old when I decided to become a guide. Uh, it's actually, you know, it's quite an interesting story. I'd never planned to be a guide. Um, my whole life I've been very, very connected to, to nature through my parents. Uh, my stepmother is a lady called Michaela Strachan in England. And my father is Nick Chevalier, and he is a film producer, a wildlife photographer. Um, he makes documentaries, such as uh, Bloodlines, that was filmed last year. And they stimulated my questions and curiosity on the natural world. And, and that's where I decided that I wanted to become a guide when I was 23 years old. I didn't want to learn 
so much theory about nature. I thought it was very important that I started to experience it, to, to really understand the natural world, because we can only really learn so much in a book. So I highly recommend you to, to get back into the bush when you can and do your trainings when you are able to. I wish you all the best of luck for that. And I really hope that you manage to get there. Family, uh, the question was, you know, do I have any family in the area? And uh, no, actually, I don't have any family in this area. I mean, in South Africa, yes. In Cape Town, I have, I actually have a twin brother. His name is Thomas. He looks exactly the same as me. Um, so it's quite strange to be far apart from someone that looks very similar to you. And um, I've got an older sister, a younger brother. Uh, step mom and, and father, and they all live in Cape Town. Uh, so not, not anywhere around here. So that's... But I, I guess if I do end up staying here, you know, you guys will become my family, and so will, the, so will Brian behind the camera, who's been super, super kind to me this morning. I was very, very nervous to be driving out in this vehicle and have all these people look at me. <laughs> but Brian's been really good for my... Well, just to make my nerves just feel a little bit better. But it's a lot to get used to, you know, to, be, to talk to a camera, to be driving, to be looking for animals. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's one experience that I'm having, and whether or not I get this job, I'm just really excited to, to challenge myself. So, ooh. What do we have here, guys? Looks like, looks like a terrapin. Wow, can you imagine how excited this terrapin has been just last night? Uh, when he just was wherever he was and he heard that rain going, he must be just so excited to be able to go to the water. But funny enough, he's actually not by the water right now. Um, he's actually just chilling in the middle of the road. Um, not quite sure what you, are, what you are up to, but it seems... You see, it seems that maybe he's come out and he's maybe might be feeding on something. I see a little bit of the grasses. The terrapins, aren't they such incredible, incredible creatures, huh? It's just so fantastic that we've had these rains. I mean, you know, I, came, I arrived in the bush just a few days ago, and the last time I was here was a year and a half ago. And, there was a lot of a lot of vegetation. There was a lot of rain, and it's just incredible to see how dry it, it, it's been this this summer, which is this is supposed to be the summer rainfall now. And um, yeah, it's been very. I think it's been very tough, and it's just so good to see this rain, um, and actually be here during that. Beautiful little terrapin. in Indiana, I will make sure that there are no terrapins in the, in the water before I drive. I've actually, yeah, I've had some very, very close experiences with terrapins when I've been going through water. So I promise you I'll be extra vigilant and make sure that I'm not driving over any terrapins. Um, it actually takes me back to a story that I had when I was at London Losey and we were, I was with one of my best friends, Sean Creswell, and we were driving. And we were going through very, very thick, thick soil, cotton, cotton soil. And we had to move, we had to move and move and go as quick as we could. Um, but then there was terrapin in the way and no ways were we going to run over that terrapin. And, uh, and so we stopped and we ended up, you know, we actually ended up being stuck in, in the sand for quite some time. But at least the terrapin was alive. Ooh, there he goes. I love their necks. Look at that neck just protruding out of that shell. Woo! Another little 
terrapin. Enjoy the rest of your day. Wow, aren't they just incredible creatures, hey? Mm. I would love to know, have you guys seen a lot of terrapins? You know, you know, I don't often get a view of them out the water. Um, you know, my experience of them has been very much in water. So this is, this is a such a, a great experience to just be sitting with the terrapin just, just outside water. But you can see he's feeling a little bit nervous now. He's put his head inside his shell. The last thing that I'll, I want to do is make him very scared of us. So I'm, I'm new here and I want to make friends with all the animals here. So I'm going to leave this good-looking terrapin alone and we'll see you maybe sometime soon. Goodbye, friend. Guys, I still don't know where I am. Wow, look at that zebra. Look at that beautiful. Wow, Dr. Debbie, we are now looking at a zebra. Isn't, she, isn't it beautiful? It's been a it's been a long time since I've spent time with these animals, and it's just it's just great to be back and and to learn. You know, there's I only spent around eight months uh, at Londolozi while I was training, uh, seven months, sorry, and um, and so I, I got to spend a fair amount of time with the wilderness, but I. I really have a lot, a lot more to learn um, from, from, from the Savi Sands. And, and so that, that's what I'm quite excited about. If I do get this opportunity to, to be with you guys here in the bush, I'm going to be able to, you know, learn and, and come back and learn more about the, the zebra and, and more about the different animals. There's another zebra just going out. There's two, actually. Beautiful. Fowl. But um, I'm very excited to, to come back and, and start learning and being back in the bush, huh? Hello, Vernie and Joburg. Yes, so during my time training as a, as a ranger there, we spent, I spent quite a bit of time with the Majinga lawn males, as well as the Marthy male. Uh, they're incredible, you know, dark mane. I'll never forget that, that, that one beautiful, beautiful line with a very, very dark mane and very dominant, the dominant male. Um, and I've learnt loads from those, from those lines there at, at London Lozi. I had many hair raising experiences when I'd be walking and they would come out of the bushes and I had no idea they were there. Well, at least, I, th you know, I had no idea, but the, my trainers knew that, that, the, that they were going to be there and they just wanted to see how I would act in that situation. But yes, I spent uh, much time with the Majigalon and with the Marthy male, um, which was, which was an, you know, I spent time with Marthy male, of course, and I never forget well, on the one day of my walks listening to the sound of of when a, uh, a leopard calls and it was just to the east of me and I, I was so sure there was the Marthly male. It's the closest I ever got on foot with the Marthly male. Um, so I did spend a, quite a bit of, fair amount of time with those animals and greatly appreciated as they taught me much about what I've known today, um, which is quite a bit, but still loads more to learn in the wilderness. And so, yeah, thank you, Vernie. It, it, it always brings such like such great memories for me when I when I talk about those lines as they were the first first dominant males that I ever really experienced and, and just to listen to them roar, you know, that I'd never been in the bush and and just to really experience that it's just a it's just another it's just another thing. So yeah, thank you and any opportunity to go back to those moments for any I'd love to, huh? But otherwise let's carry on. Uh, we've seen some beautiful things this morning. Uh, it, it's been 
have been very kind to me this morning and hopefully we'll Debbie, we can still see the other two, the giraffe and the, and the elephant. Um, but otherwise, let's keep going. And uh, we're going to be linking back to James, and we'll chat to you a bit later. Thank you, everyone, who's been involved, and see you now. Now, what I wanted to show you here is just at how quickly things have happened. I mean, we've noticed how fast the pans filled up We've noticed how fast the baboon's tail uh, became green, or certainly yellow, and look how fast the elephants found this patch of delightful mud. <laughs> they've already found this mud, they've gone and they've wallowed in it and they've sprayed it all over their bodies, and I think this is a fairly good kind of mud, don't you, Viam? You want me to taste it? It's good smelling mud. I'm not really going to taste it. So of a fine consistency. And these are the kind of pans, of course, that form during the course of a normal summer. Begins with a warthog, after a little puddle is formed, then perhaps a buffalo will come and lie in it, then a couple more warthogs, eventually maybe a rhino, and perhaps then the elephants will come. And it eventually becomes a very large pan, like some of the ones that we've got on Vulture's Nest Road. Just having a bit of a listen. Let me plug myself in. Still very subdued, very quiet at the moment. We'll see if that gets louder during the course of the day. Sorry, excuse the banging. There we go. Door shut. On we go. I haven't seen anything in the way of mammals since I last saw you. That's in keeping with the tradition of the last few days, where, well, the last few mornings, where I have looked at birds and bushes for much of the morning, trying desperately to find some mammals. I'd quite like to find the elephants that were frolicking in that tiny little mud patch, though. So we are now also still on these sort of eastern fringes of Juma. We're on a road called Ledwood Road, which is just running parallel with the eastern boundary. Scott drove the eastern boundary. No tracks of those lions coming across, I'm afraid. It's possible to miss them on a day like t today because, of course, the rain would have created a crust over the top of the soil, and so it is possible to miss tracks. But I mean, the lion's pretty heavy. Possible to miss leopard tracks, difficult to miss big lions coming across the place. Ooh, now, oh, now they've flown away. I don't know how many of you, I know lots of you are keeping a bird list. There were some red faced mouse birds crawling there and they flew across. Long tails with a little red face, They're very pretty little birds. We'll see if we can find them again. I don't think we'll spend too much time on them. Very delightful morning out today. An air of expectation fills the atmosphere. Here we go, some water back. So a very interesting comment from Annie in British Columbia in Canada. While we stop and have a look at these beautiful water buck, we're smelling even more musty than normal. Because of the rain, I think. Annie, you say that that instinct to look after youngsters, even of other species, comes as a result of having given birth recently and a sort of I'm sure it's a hormonal thing where the female has got a much higher or an elevated level of certain hormones which will in turn make her more mothering. I think that sounds extremely plausible. I'm not sure what the status of that lioness was with her oryx or, you know, the leopard with the baboon or the leopard with the impala, but quite possible that they would just given birth or recently given birth. And so the hormones that create that mothering emotion, that mothering instinct, uh, could well have been coursing through their bodies. Great one. Thank you for that, Annie. So the waterbuck 
I've never seen so many waterbuck as I have on this reserve, and I find it very strange, simply because of, they're not called waterbuck for nothing. They're called waterbuck because they normally like to hang around water, and I, they don't really here. I suppose it's probably because they wouldn't have anything to eat if they did just hang around the water. They too, though, do not look in bad condition to me. I've seen pictures of animals in the Kruger Park, with their ribs showing and their hips showing. And those waterbuck look to me to be absolutely fine, as do most of the impala here, as do the zebra, as I've said, and the wildebeest. So things are not dire here at Juma yet. And maybe if we get a few more nights of rain like we've just had now, the tough times will be prolonged even further. Here they go. Um, I almost took this question seriously until the end of it came. And uh, you want to know if the weather is forecast, if any further rain is forecast in the weather, or will a, another dance be needed? I definitely don't think another dance will be needed. Um, every time, uh, we've done three now, and I'm forced to watch the highlights package by the final control, and you know, I mean, it's it's all very well performing like that, but when you then have to watch yourself behaving like an utter goon show uh, in front of a you know, fairly large audience, uh, well, you start to question your own sanity after a while. Anyway, it seemed to be very effective. In a, on a serious note, we are predicted to have very similar weather to the weather we had yesterday for the next three or four days. Now, what that means is that it'll be quite cloudy like this, which it was yesterday. It got very hot during the course of yesterday afternoon, and then the actual storm that I cast dispersions on throughout the drive that came up from the south actually delivered some rain. So I think we might have a little bit more in the next three or four days. It would be very nice indeed. What we want is those big storms. We don't want that frontal weather to come up from the southeast, which tends to just bring a bit of wind and a bit of drizzle. We want big storms to come in to dump a good few inches on us. And we just hope that the growth season, I mean, for the trees, I think the growth season's largely over. I don't think that they're going to start flushing new leaves now, especially the deciduous ones. Semi-deciduous ones will probably produce leaves. But I think many will be already going into their kind of dormancy. But the grasses will flush, we hope. A bit of sun. I can already see a little bit of a green tinge on some many of the grass plants. What I'd like to see now, of course, is a leopard. Uh, Sam has managed to find a woodland kingfisher. Let's head across to him. Welcome, welcome back, everyone. We here, here we are with a woodland kingfisher, one of the popular birds of the summer season here, a resident kingfisher. Um, I'd love to know if you guys can tweet in just the names of the other kingfishers that we get here in southern Africa. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, the woodland kingfisher was one of the first birds that I ever learned, and. You know, I spent a lot of time learning about it from a design point of view when I was at university and, and just living and listening to it. I'll never forget all my friends just saying to me, <whistles> and that was, that was them trying to help me to learn this kingfisher call. I mean, I was absolutely terrible at my bird calls at the beginning. It took me a long time. Maybe we'll actually, Hear, hear the sound of the kingfisher? I'll just give it some time. But yes, yeah, so it took me a long time to learn my bird calls, and, and the woodlands kingfisher was actually one of my first birds that I, I finally got. So whenever I see the woodlands kingfisher, I always have a little bit of a smile. But uh, linking back to what I was saying a little bit earlier about um, you know what biomimicry was and learning from nature, you know, they've actually that design of that beak is so perfect for diving into water. You can imagine they sit at the edge of uh, 
of, of watering areas, mainly the woodland kingfisher, you know, something that doesn't really drink from the watering areas. But, you know, when you think of all the other kingfishers, why do they have a beak that's so um, perfect for diving into water? Um, and it's just so, such a clever design, you know, so they've actually mimicked the design of the beak of a kingfisher to the front of a train in Japan because that helps it move more efficiently. So it's incredible once we, when we stop and we begin to look at the natural world and, and all its magnificence and its designs, we can learn so much, uh, especially about how we can become more sustainable within our cities and we can start bringing that, the intelligence and the wonder of the natural world in to our cities. So thank you. Mr. Woodland Kingfisher, for, for sharing us your designs and your beauty and your perfection. And but let's head on. Susan in Brooklyn. Wow, I still find it unbelievable that I'm talking to someone that far away from me and I'm sitting here in the Sawabi Sands. It's just incredible. I'm still trying to get my mind around that fact. But to answer your question, it was a, it, a great question, Susan. It was, the question was, you know, can we not only mimic the designs of the natural world, but can we also mimic the social structure and the functions and the processes. Well, yes, Susan, to answer it, yes, we can. We can start learning about the way in which other animals are within a social system. We can learn, for example, the intelligence of ants. You know, ants will, will move out and scatter and decentralize themselves to find water and food. And when they go to find, when they find water, they collect that water and then they leave a pheromone that, and then allows all the other ants to learn and go to that water. So that sense of decentralization is very empowering. It, it allows the, the ant structure to be a lot more resilient. So they're actually learning that the understanding of decentralization within cities. You know, you could learn the structure of a leaf system within designing for uh, water systems within cities. You can learn from the dynamics and the social structure of a lion pride within business. You can learn all sorts of things. So the natural world can create education for us within social, uh, bureaucratic things to designing systems to... I mean, it's, it's as much as you want to look into it. It's all about playing with the idea and, and applying it to, to, certain, to certain things. So I hope that answers your question, Susan. Um, I'm still relatively new with that subject. It's only been three years in practice, and you know, I do my own designs, and I, and I draw my own pictures of the natural world. But I'm still aware that I really want to see an elephant. So let's see if we can find one. If I heard that correctly, that was, was that Tappy? Tappy? Um, thank you very much. Oh, Bethy. Oh, Bethy. Um, yes, so I am uh, I'm one of the brothers from Sustainable Brothers and Sisters, which is a, an organization my twin bro brother and I created in Cape Town around trying to create uh, critical awareness on, on both social and ecological systems and how we, as the youth, can begin to learn more. Um, yeah, so I'm 25, and I set that up about a couple of years ago with my brother in Cape Town. Um, and, you know, just to, it's been a, a, one great experience. Uh, we, we've never known what we were doing, but if I had to explain my passion, my passion was in ecology and learning about the natural world and, and, um, and how we don't have to create separation between sociology and ecology. That has definitely been my, 
my passion is definitely within that. So my brother is a very social person. He, he loves to understand people and he, he's very passionate about the economy and, and the green economy to be more specific. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Mappy. It's been, it's been an incredible journey being part of an organization such as Sustainable Brothers and Sisters. And what's so great about it is, is there's also created a nice platform for some of my best friends from university to come together and start creating change, you know? Because, you know, change, I think, doesn't come from the individual, you know? I don't think anything lives on its own here. It realizes it's part of an ecosystem. Much like that, we decided to create an organization that was, that was based on learning about people's skills and what they can provide and coming together as a collective. So, thank you very much. But you know what's so interesting for me to be out here? It's how dry these, how dry these bush willows are. I mean, wow, have a look at how yellow these leaves are. It almost feels like it's autumn here. Hi, Deborah. Um, the question was whether we have any trees that are producing fruit and whether you know that's been like stopped because of this drought. Um, so I haven't spent a lot of time here, I've only been here for about two days. Um, and I know that there are many maruna trees around us. Um, and normally marunas create maruna fruits, which the elephants love so much. I used to watch elephants banging their backs against the maruna trees to try and knock all those fruits off the tree. Um, but I haven't actually seen many marina fruits. Normally they come around January, you see loads of marunas. And it's an interesting, interesting question. I would love to know the answer myself. Maybe James knows the answer to that question. Um, so I'll guess see, maybe, see if he can maybe answer that for you. So we're going to be making a, a link to James. Um, thanks for being on safari so far. Hopefully we can find some more animals out here. And um, I'll see you in a bit. There, everybody, is a little red-backed trike. And it's sitting in one of the most beautiful bushes when it is flowering. It's called a Carissa by Spinosa, or a forest num-num. Isn't that a wonderful time? Uh, term to call a bush. It smells like jasmine, it's like a local jasmine bush. And we were alerted to the alarm calling of these red-backed trikes. I'm not sure what, there's another one just up ahead shouting. That's, it sounds like an alarm call, but it's actually their normal call. They don't sort of make any other call other than that chip, 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 chip. It's not quite the glorious song of the black crown chagra, but you know, some people don't have very good voices and some do. Now, just up ahead of us, of course, we have found a great mystery. Um, the mystery, of course, is not that the Land Rover is stuck, because, of course, Land Rovers are renowned for becoming mired and breaking down. The mystery is how on earth it got there and who it belongs to. I cannot answer those mysteries. And um, as Kirsty says, maybe Brent was driving it. I think that's, that's a distinct possibility. <laughs> but I'm not sure that we're going to get, be able to get past it. In fact, I'm pretty sure we won't. Have you? Uh, Brent would be able to get past it. You think Brent would be able to get past it? <laughs> that's called reverse psychology, Vim. Exactly. What do you think happened? That seems to have some very nice uh, Christmas lights strung to the front of it. See that? Very nice. It's obviously a festival Land Rover of some kind. Maybe there's some dark shadow damage on the door. Oh. said that the mysterious leopard known as Dark Shadow perhaps um, removed the owners. Yeah, 
and we got past. If we get a flat tyre, you'll be fixing it. Now, as we drive along here, oh, before we carry on, Liam, look, there's a tortoise. Let's get out and have a look at the tortoise, and I will answer Deborah's question while we do that. Deborah, you want to know about whether there are any fruits or any trees that have not fruited the way they should have normally. Deborah, absolutely, there are plenty. Uh, the marula is the most obvious one. Marula trees, of course, are the most fruity trees that we get here, and we had a pathetic marula season this year. I'm just going to move away some vegetation so you can see this fellow's face if he sticks it out again. So let's just leave him quietly there. There, he'll st he'll, he will eventually stick his face out. Deborah, so the marulas have been pathetic this year. One or two trees fruited and very early on, and then there was nothing. Here he comes. This is the leopard tortoise. And then the sour plum trees, uh, which normally produce those really fascinating sort of um, orange fruits, which are sour, uh, well, very sweet to start with, and then very sour if you eat them. They've been very poor. I haven't seen one. I've seen trees that started with the green fruit, and then they just never ripened. And I think you'll find the guari bushes, which should fruit at some time around now, will probably be much less than normal. And the white berry bushes as well, which produce lovely sort of pea-tasting, white, sweet white berries. They don't seem to have produced any fruit yet either. This is quite a shy tortoise. Anyway, he will be very happy with some rain. He'll be able to have a drink, fill up his security system. His security system, of course, is to void his bowels on anything that tries to pick him up. And that, of course, is very dangerous in a time of drought, because then you can become dehydrated. Anyway, that's the leopard tortoise. That's quite an old one, I think. Quite big for this area, probably in excess of 20 years, which I think is impressive. Now, let us continue on our little boat ride, you know, after the extensive rains we've had, we need to get on the boat and... <laughs> now... <laughs> Jimelin in Oklahoma, I haven't heard from you for a while, so welcome back. And you say... You say that perhaps the lack of rain and therefore lack of proper fruiting on the leopard orchid has resulted in my failure to procure uh, Scarlett Johansson as a result of my use of it as a traditional medicine. Yes, that is quite possible, Jimmel, and I think that that's much more likely than the other obvious solution, which of course is that it doesn't actually work. Now, for those of you who don't know what on earth Jimelin is talking about, um, leopard orchids are traditionally used, apparently. I've never met a traditional person who's used them for this, but the books will tell you that traditionally what you do is you go and you take a piece of leopard orchid out of a tree, you chew it, and then you spit it out at midnight on the full moon and say the name of the one you want, and she will immediately start to think of you. Now, whether or not Scarlett Johansson has ever thought of me as I've chewed um, enthusiastically on the canes of the leopard orchid in, during every full moon that there's been since I've arrived at Juma, I'm not sure I couldn't tell you. Right, we're going to continue driving up this drainage line and see if we can't pick up maybe some tracks of a leopard. So on in a drainage line like this, of course, you're going to have a situation where there isn't the same crust that there is on the road. So if you do... Sorry. Up, uh, to the south. No, that was on Buffalo's Hook. So you'll find tracks going to and from much more easily than you would if you weren't here. <laughs> a 
Uh, Lou DeLion, you say you reckon Dark Shadow took that land over for a spin, but because of a lack of opposable thumbs, was unable to change the flat tyre or sort of wedge it out of where it got stuck. Yeah, quite possible, of course, very likely. Yeah, um, Dark Shadow was a recent invention, wasn't he? He came since here last year. Oh, he was here since last year, okay. So lovely driving along here. Beautiful smell of the rain coming off the ground. Watch out here. <laughs> Sandblaster, wonderful question about the tortoise. Why have they got those square markings? They'd be better served being maybe green or a uniform brown color. Um, there are two reasons. Firstly, the square, the squ you know, the square markings, I'm assuming you mean the scoots, which are actually hexagonal. Um, they have those hexagonal scoots because that's how they grow. That's how the tortoise is able to sort of expand its size. I mean, I'm sure there w could be other ways of doing it, but because of the hard keratin sheath on the top of the shell, those kind of scoots and the arrangement of them is a tremendously brilliant biological method of being able to expand something hard like that. The only other animals, of course, that have a hard shell are insects and they must climb out of their skins in order to get a new hard shell, which is obviously very dangerous because for a time they are without a hard shell, hard protective casing. Now on a tortoise, that shell, because of its brilliant design of those little independent scoots, it can actually expand without the tortoise ever having to climb out of it. Well, I mean, the tortoise can't climb out of it, it's part of its body. So that's one of the reasons they've got those. Then the color, you see, well, first of all, green is a pigment that almost universally only occurs in plants. You find it in one family of birds called the terracos. Otherwise, every other green color, so green on parrots, for example, is not, made, is not green at all. It's made by a tricks of the light and yellow pigment. And so that's one of the reasons why you don't find green animals like that. You do find the odd green insect, but again, that's often normally a trick. And then oh, what, that dappled color is also a brilliant color to be if you live in the bush, which is what they do. They, they're not above ground, so they're not sort of uh, at a stage or at a height where they're obvious. And so they're in amongst the bush all the time, and that blackened gold mottled color is actually very difficult to see unless you see it moving especially if you don't see in very good detail. We see very nice detail. We don't see um, particularly great contrast. So for us, it's actually easier to see them than it would be for some of the predators. So this very nice little boat ride we're having here, Viam. I think I'm just losing a little bit of co communications, but I think it's Grace. You want to know about the difference between a turtle and a tortoise. A, the difference, I think, is something to do with language and quite a lot to do with biology. Out here, a tortoise is the, uh, they belong to a group of, of reptiles called the Chelonidae, and the Chelonidae will have a number of different representatives. One of them is a turtle, and the turtle to us out here is a sea-dwelling uh, chelonid. So it would be the green-back turtle, the leather-back turtle, um, the hawk's bill turtle. They live in the sea. They live in salt water, and they come ashore and lay their eggs during the course of the summer. Then a terrapin would be a freshwater version of a turtle. And they live in fresh water. They go into a state of estivation when it's dry, and then they come out into the puddles again, just like Sam showed you. Um, probably a marsh terrapin he showed you. And then a tortoise yeah. is a purely land-dwelling chelonid. <laughs> so a purely land-dwelling chelonid, you'll only find them on the land. They don't swim, they don't live in water. Now I know that in America, and I'm not sure how or why this is, a tortoise is often referred to as a turtle, um, but out here we wouldn't, we wouldn't refer to them as a turtle. I hope that explains everything to you, Grace. Not much in the way of animals in this little boat ride, anyway. So it goes. 
Watch your head, everybody. Yes, that's quite possible, entirely possible. James Richard, you say when you saw that Land Rover, you pictured Brent diving into the bushes and having got it stuck you know, simply so that he could save face. I imagine that when Brent Lear Smith, now for those of you who don't know, Brent was got a Land Cruiser stuck here the other day, which he subsequently blamed on someone else, I must just say. Um, but when he heard a Land Rover, one of our Land Rovers, driving up the drainage line towards him, I imagine the sense of horror and foreboding he felt must have been quite palpable. He's very lucky it was Scott, not me. You know what's the first thing they teach you on 414 course? What? They lock the hubs at the front. Yes, lock the hubs at the front. Which he failed to do, didn't he, Vian? Yes. And then blame someone else for not doing it for him. <laughs> Yes, exactly, Exranga, you're quite correct. Appropriate that we went on a boat ride because Carol said that I smiled like a pirate, RR, when on my first drive. Vim, do you recall me smiling like a pirate? I have, I have at times been accused of being a little bit like Jack Sparrow, so maybe that's sort of a pirate. I'm savvy? I don't just, I just don't recall. You just don't recall. Now, Dr. Debbie, a nice question. You want to know what I remember from my, <laughs> most about my first drive? I remember I had two great drives. I'd, there was a second one where we had the dogs, hey, Viam, in the afternoon. First one with you. First one with you, okay. And we had those wild dogs in the sighting with the lions, and it was just unbelievable. It's the most incredible thing. I couldn't believe my luck. I thought this job was going to be incredibly easy. And then we have a morning like this, where we found one water buck and half a terrapin sticking out of the mud. Anyway, so it goes. Hello, Stephen. You say I need to... Get Pull my act together, Sam's doing a, a, is putting me to shame on the species count. It could be new presenter's luck. Well, it might be new presenter's luck. It might just be that he's more talented than I am in the bush. Uh, time will tell, of course. to know what advice I would give to Sam as a new presenter. Um, I could say all sorts of facetious things, but I'm not going to. I would say the greatest piece of advice that I could give anybody it applies to just about anything you do in life. But because this camera is on your face and it kind of bears into your soul and you've got up to 3,000 people with a TV show, we've got three million people watching you. You can't fake it. You can't fake it. If you try and fake something, people will be able to see through you. It's not like being able to fake it in the presence of one or two. You've got lots of people staring into your, staring into your eyes and looking into the depths of your soul. And so the advice, the only advice I'd give him was to be himself, which I believe is exactly what he's doing. So let's head straight across to him and I will see you hopefully at Treehouse Waterhole. Welcome back everyone. How is this for a sighting? Eh? We saw a hyena this morning and now we're seeing two hyenas in the water. This is so great. Eh? They're loving the water. Look how they're just playing in the water. Oof. Oh, that's amazing, eh? Hey? Oh! You know, 
It's amazing to watch play within animals. Animals love to play with each other. It's a, it's a form of affection and, and the way in which they can communicate maybe their form of emotions for each other. So it's amazing to watch animals play. It just reminds me that I should play more and, and definitely, ooh, they're coming towards us. Hello. Amazing guys. I'm gonna just keep quiet. Look how curious they are. Wow. Wow. Guys, that was a f one of my first experiences of having two l big hyenas come close to my car. What an incredible experience. Normally, it's, I've had the, the youngsters that come and are very inquisitive about, about vehicles, but these two came straight to us. They sniffed our vehicle, and I was very, yeah, I, had, I think it was good to be quiet. I think it was good to to just let him interact with our vehicle and man I, I've been very privileged to have that experience. They are so excited for these oh <laughs> the rain the rain has come. It's a joyous moment out here in the bush when the rains come. And I wonder what they were doing here. They were, did they leave? Brian, are they part of this? A part of that den? Do you know? Might be. It might be. Wow. Well, a little bit closer. I'm just going to see if I can go along the dam here, guys, and see if we can get a good shot of them in this water. It's, it's an unbelievable sighting. Not often you're gonna see hyenas playing in a watering hole. Let's take this all in. Look at that. Is that good for you, Brian? No. You know, just going back to, just going back to what I was saying a bit earlier, you know, Play is a very important part of, a, of an animal's learning, a behavior. Yeah? You'll often see lions, little baby cubs, stalking each other and jumping on each other. It's one of the greatest things to watch. And you know, they learn so much through those little play experiences. And you know, although these guys are not very young, you know, actually that can teach us all, all, all of us listeners a lesson or two about how to be playful even as we grow up. Oof. Take this in, guys. This is this is a first first sighting for me to see to see hyenas play like this in a little bit of water. If you guys have any questions or queries, please tweet them through. Let me know what you think of these hyenas playing in the water and giving such joy on my first drive. How exciting. Now, just going back to what James said a little bit earlier, thank you very much, James, for that advice. I highly appreciate it. You know, James and Scott and the whole team have been very great, very, very good to me over the last few days. It was extremely nerve-wracking to come through here and 
and do what I'm doing at the moment. But with the support of them, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's great. Thank you, Morian. The question was whether I was friends with um, anyone here before I came. Yes, so I, I knew Nikki Austin, the director, um, fairly well. We knew each other when we were in Cape Town. We both grew up in Cape Town. So I knew her fairly well, but I wouldn't say that I saw her a lot. It's so great to come and meet her now in the bush and see her and get to know her a little bit more. It's been great. But otherwise, I didn't know anyone else on the team. You know, I'd, I'd heard of Scott and I'd heard of James Hendry and, uh, you know, S Scott Dyson was at, um, at St. Gita and he was good friends with some of the friends that I had within this, the ranging field. And it was great to put a, put a name to a face and learn more about the, these guides who have been in the industry for many, many years. So it was great to actually meet James and, and Scott. What a privilege, actually, to, to come and learn from them and, and, and learn about their experiences. They've been here for a, for a long time. They've got a long history in the bush. And I'm still very, very early on in my career, so I'm very, very grateful. But look at these guys, guys. Look at them just playing. It's so great. Wow. I'd be really interested to know if these guys are from the den, huh? Hi there, Hazel. Do I know about um, hyenas eating tires? Uh, not that I have ever seen that or experienced that. I mean, I once experienced a hyena eating my seat. <laughs> I was uh, sleeping and camping out in the bush the one night, and I came back to my vehicle, and half the seat was chewed. Um, so I haven't seen a tire, but I've seen a seat being eaten, and you know, I've I've had uh, shoes that have gone missing. Uh, you know, I was blaming my friends, but really it was actually the hyenas that were taking my shoes, not to wear, but to make their jaws probably a little stronger. But I've had some great experiences. You know, the one, the first night I ever slept out in the bush, I was, I was uh, camping and I had to look after everyone and make sure that, you know, I was the only one awake and I had to walk around the camp and check if any, every, nothing was coming into the camp. And I had never experienced any behavior of any animal. And, and I was sitting in camp, and all of a sudden these hyenas started coming down towards our camp. And Chibas, I got so scared. I was so scared because I had no idea what to do. And I just ran to everyone. I started waking everyone up. And I was like, guys, what do I do now? What do I do? And, and they all laughed at me and they said, well, I don't know if they laughed at me. I think they were quite tired. Uh, but they just said, Sam, all you need to do is shine your torch at them and they'll run away. So you don't need to be scared. And you don't have to be too worried about hyena on foot. It's okay. But the problem is if you do fall asleep, I can imagine some of you guys have heard what a hyena will do when you sleep. Sometimes they will just come and nibble on you and see what you are and wake up in the morning without an arm. So I highly recommend not sleeping out in the bush without someone awake. Um, that goes to everyone. <laughs> no one is Superman out here. And that was the brilliant thing about coming to the bush, you know. A lot of the time in the city, you don't, you don't really learn about how animals are and, and, and to be part of an ecosystem and to really actually know your place and have respect where it's due. So I have loads and I've built loads and loads of respect for the, for the wilderness. Michaela, wow, cheapers. So glad that you're 
that you're watching right now. That's very exciting. Thanks for watching and tweeting in. Um, that makes me feel a little bit at home. Uh, just three days I was sitting with you in the kitchen, having a cup of coffee and wondering, can I do this? Well, it seems like it's going OK so far. <laughs> but thank you for your support, Michaela. It's, uh, it's great to, to know that you've been watching and seeing what, what it's been like for me on my first drive of wild live safari. And um, yeah, maybe Ollie's there with you. And if Oliver is there with you, my little brother Oliver, give him a little high five and, and wish him luck at his next day at school. I hope he learns something cool. <laughs> but how awesome are these hyenas, huh? They are incredible. Hi there, Lucy in Indiana. Yes, I'm extremely, extremely lucky to be experiencing hyenas playing in water for the first time. It's, it's not something I've seen before, and so it's great. And I, I, you know, it's both the combination of them playing and them being in the water that, that really excites me. Ooh. Ooh. What did you do wrong over there, huh? It's like they're having a jacuzzi, man. Look at them. <laughs> it's so great, eh? Yeah, Lucy, this is a, an epic sighting. That one. I'm definitely having um, some luck with the animals today. I've already seen a hyena earlier this, on this morning, and this is the second sighting of hyena that I've seen. So they've been very kind. And they actually came and said hello to me. I came to my vehicle. Well, I wonder how long they'll be in here for. Mm. What are they biting on? Seems to be maybe like a twig. It looks like a twig. What do you think, Brian? Mm. No, I think the other one's quite curious to find out as well. What did you... I, I, want, I want that stick. I want it. <laughs> wow. I think it's a stick. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with stick. It could be something else, but that's what I think it is. Now look at those spots, uh, you can tell very clearly that that is the spotted hyena. I've never seen the brown hyena. I'd love to one day be able to experience the brown hyena and how different it would be to its cousin. They just can't get tired of it, eh? They don't even know when the rain's gonna come back, so they're just having all the fun in the world. Look at them. Hey, Brian, have you seen this before? Not like this, no. Never? This is spectacular. In case I didn't uh, introduce the cameraman behind me, his name is Brian, and he has been fantastic on my first drive. He's really helped me navigate myself around these roads. I really have no idea where I'm going, and he just says, go left, Sam, go right. And I trust his intuition. And look where it took us. It took us to hyenas playing in a watering hole. I'd love to know if any of you guys have Played with a friend like this in a jacuzzi. That was Robin. Hi there, Robin. Uh, your question was, they looked like 
they are males because they are smaller? That's a good, that's a good question. You know, as we know that hyenas are matriarchal, we know that the, the males are subordinate and smaller. So I think they very well may be males, but we can tell that by having a look at what genitalia they have. I think that you might just be right. Yep. Well done. Well done. That is one male, and we'll have a look at the other one just now and see. But I think that you might be right. So if, for anyone that didn't know that hyenas are part of a matriarchal society, that means that the woman um, of the clan is the leader, and she looks after and dominates everything by the den, which I am very excited to have a look at one when I have the time. Ooh, wait. Where are you off to? Yeah, it seems like it's two males. Wow. Oh, wow. Guys, are they, still, are they coming back? Really? What are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? How was that for a sighting, everyone? That is a first for me, and I'm sure it's a first for many, many other people. Hey, Brian, did you enjoy that? Absolutely incredible. Mm. Oh, no, hold on. They, they're not tired of that. Hold on. Let's, uh, let's take that. Oh, I'm coming straight back. Don't... Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> This behavior is so incredible to watch, eh? They're not tired of the water. They're not going to get tired of the water, I don't think, for a while. They're going to get nice and comfortable in this water. Hi there, James Taylor. Um, yes, I just got a Twitter account. I must have got a Twitter account about two weeks ago when I was watching James Hendry out live on Safari, and I wanted to ask him a question. And I think my Twitter Twitter account was um, Sammy, oh no, Sam dash Chev. So S A M dash C H E V. I think that that was my Twitter account. Otherwise, I'm not too sure. You'll have to, you'll have to have a look. See if you can. I'd love you to take me. That'd be great. Thank you very much. I'd really appreciate that. I truly, I don't, don't think that they're going to get tired of this anytime soon. in New York. Jeepers, I'm, this is just amazing to think that I'm now talking to someone from New York. It's Indiana and then it's somewhere else and now we're back, we're back in New York. So here we are live in the Salvi Sands and I'm talking to Eric in New York and you, your question was, do hyenas, after playing like this, then become aggressive on one another? That's a very, very, that's a great question. Thank you very much for that. You know, I've, first of all, never seen a sighting like this where where they've been playing like this, um, especially in water. But I can imagine that sometimes they, they, they can turn into fights when, when one might hurt the other one a little bit too much and it just growls and comes back at a cookie. So my, my, my experience is that, that they've been mainly play, play with each other and then they'll settle down and relax. Uh, but I'm sure at times they definitely will get a little bit agitated with one another and growl and get a little bit angry just to tell the other one who, who's boss. <laughs> a great question. I'd love to research that and find out more. I'm sure James has had a few experiences. Same with Scott. I almost feel like I want to jump in there with him. Eh? <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, Monique in London. You've never seen hyenas play in water like this. I think many of our viewers haven't either. So this is a, this is a first for quite a few of us. Very, very exciting. I think they've gone back to the stick play. <laughs> this is my stick. I really want to go back to that point on play. I think it's such an important part of any social organization. I think we lose a lot of that when we grow older, the, the ability to be able to play. And if we can try to keep that childlike playfulness within us as we grow older, I think that's a very, very important trait to try and do. I guess I was trying to play with my dancing last night and I got up on my hands. So that's my little bit of form of play. So my little bit of social, social organization last night. Ooh, what are they doing now? Hello, Rain from Ohio. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I do love to track. Um, that's been something that has fascinated me over the last couple of years, maybe just two years, actually. I've only been um, looking at different ecologies and ecosystems for the last two years. And, you know, to be honest, you know, I've had experiences where I've had someone guide me into how to track an animal and how to experience the natural world. But the one time I was completely on my own was actually a time when I was in Brazil. I was living in in the Pantanal, staying at a house there with uh, a friend. And uh, I went out early in the morning. I packed a bag of water and some Energade. Oh, it wasn't Energade there. I don't know what it was. But I went walking for, for a couple of hours through the Pantanal, and um, I came across Jaguar tracks. And um, that was thrilling. Yeah? That was just, uh, my mind started to go, am I going to see a Jaguar? Am I going to see a Jaguar? And on that particular occasion, I didn't manage to see a jaguar, but to be walking around with the footsteps of a jaguar is just as much of an experience as actually finding one, you know. Sometimes not finding an animal is just as good, you know, because we sometimes become obsessed with trying to find things. But just to bring ourselves into that mindset of another being and another animal is an incredible experience in itself. So I highly recommend that to anyone who is interested in going into, whether it's tracking in your own countries and you know, badgers and foxes in, in England or wherever you are, animals and start to learn about the intelligence of animals through tracking has is, is is, is done a lot for me. So thank you very much from that, for that question. It would definitely be the Jaguar. Was the question, what is my favorite part of the world? Wow, that's a, James, I love the whole thing, hey? <laughs> Leslie, I love, yeah, Leslie, thank you very much for that question. I, you know, I've still got many, many places to go and experience on this beautiful planet. Um, I've loved learning about different ecosystems and ecologies from, from, from England to Southern Africa to, to, to Brazil, but, I think the most, the, the, the place in the world that stands out for me where I had a lot of my learning was out in the Cedarburg Mountains, just outside Cape Town. I was working for an organization called the Cape Leopard Trust doing environmental education. Um, and I spent about four months there uh, with, a, with a girl called Edine from the Congo and a, a guy called Hadley Linus. And we just, and he was the other environmental educator. And we spent many, many months just learning about the landscape of the Cedarburg and the rock structures and looking for fossils and, and looking at uh, rock paintings. So I had, I've had a, a few 
really, really great experiences, but I can't actually, it's very difficult to nail down one place. This beautiful gift that this planet is is just magnificent from any corner that we go to. So it's how we see beauty within. Well, guys, this sighting with hyena has been incredible. Hi there, Michael. Good question. The question was, how can they drink this water without picking up a disease? Well, you know, as you can imagine, the animals of these landscapes have been adapting to this environment for many, many, many years. And so their guts have been able to digest and to be able to drink these water, these waters. So it's not saying that they don't ever pick up a disease from these waters. I'm sure every now and then they do, but they have very, very resilient uh, bodies and organs that, that is able to cope with some of the difficult water that they might be drinking from time to time. But that is something that I've, I haven't questioned further, and I would, I'm sure if, if we ask James Henry and Scott Dyson, they would probably give us a good, a good answer to that. Um, but that, that's what I would say. I would say that they've adapted to this, to this landscape and, and they've created resilience, resilience to any kind of difficulty that might, that might face them. Wow. Right, everyone. I'm sure that was an amazing sighting for many of you. I just heard that it was, and it was an incredible ex sighting for me. And just great to, to be introduced to the Sabi Sands with the playfulness of our hyena. But we're going to link back to James now and enjoy that part of the drive. See you later. I promise we have found one or two things while you've been looking at the hyena. I mean, it has been an incredible sighting for you. We found a warthog. Kirsten said, we're not coming to a warthog. We found a, a monkey alone in a tree. She said the hyenas are much too impressive for us to come to your monkey. And then we found an impala who had a swollen shoulder and he absconded into the bush. I, I'm not making this up, I promise you. We did find three different species of mammals. Unfortunately, Sam found something more entertaining. Anyway, we're going to be driving along to the western sector now. I'm actually starting to hallucinate now. There's no need to show people my hallucinations. After it's in the brief. I keep thinking I can see a leopard lying on the ground. Of course, that's just because I want to see a leopard lying on the ground. That would be the ultimate ignominy if, if old Sam drives around the next corner and finds Karula draped in a tree. I'll probably just drive straight home. Stefan, you're in Indiana, and you want to know if I've seen a, a, the video of the hyena and the leopard showing the warthog. I haven't seen that, Stefan. I'd be fascinated to know. So please do tweet it to us. That really would be really interesting to see. I've, you do come across the odd example of this, where two predators seemingly in competition will actually share a kill with each other. Uh, I've, I've seen it with hyenas and lions. Sometimes they'll share a kill. I have. I think if I've seen, you know what? I think I actually have seen leopards and hyenas sharing a kill, where it'll be one hyena who kind of sneak in and the, the kill's too big for either of them to take away. Often they'll both scavenge on the same thing. So let's say there's a dead buffalo and they're both a bit peckish, then they might share that kind of a kill. Now share, of course, is a strong term. It just means that the prey is probably too big for either of them to steal and abscond with but that will be a fascinating video to see. Thank you, Stefan. Here we are in the vast expanse of uh, Impala Plains. Where there is, Viam? No Impala. No Impala, or indeed, anything. But you can see this flush of green that is 
starting to pop up as the sun hits the grass, so it will start to photosynthesize and we'll get these little flashes of green, which is marvelous. Top of the street, top of the street, top of the street. Look. A yellow-fronted canary singing. Oh, I think they're such pretty birds and such a beautiful call. Isn't that nice? Yes, I know it's not a leopard, but you know it's 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 a very beautiful creature. As is this. Look at this jumping spider there. You see him jump onto me. He's on my finger. Mm. Thumb. Mm. How cool is that? As a tiny little jumping spider. Take that, Sam Chevalier. There was a question about hallucinations from Tony, I think, in London. You say you want to see my hallucinations. Tony, I don't think that that's always the case. I have some fairly disturbing hallucinations. What a magnificent little little fellow. I'm going to put him, set him free so that he might too frolic with the hyenas in the water. Go away. There we go. OK, on we go. Sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind to them, you know? Mm -hmm. That's tough love. Tough love. Exactly what that spider received. <laughs> ah, I see. So Tony and Lou DeLion, you think maybe I ate some of that mud and that's why I'm hallucinating leopards all over the place. I didn't eat any of that mud. Had I, I wouldn't, I would say yes, very plausible. Um, I think I'm hallucinating out of desperation though. Yesterday evening's drive was actually really nice. We saw some good stuff. But the last two mornings have been, well, still quiet on my front. Anyway, at least we've got Sam finding things today. I did see a dung beetle also fly past. I know there have been lots of questions about dung beetles of late and where they are. Well, there's a bit of rain, they will come out. Oh, listen. Just listen, there's some frogs calling, they've come out. That's not a frog, that's a, that's a green, at least a, yes, a green wood hoopoo. But just behind us, there were some frogs going. They've stopped now, though. Look at all these puddles around us, into which the frogs will come. So excited, no doubt. That's a frog calling behind us. No, it's not. I'm talking absolute nonsense. It's an alarm calling helmet shrike. I what it's alarming at. I'm just going to go back. While I do that, Mafuta. Uh, Mafuta, I'm not sure why you've given yourself that as a Twitter handle, but apparently your real name is Russell. I think I'm going to refer to you as Russell. I'm not sure I can bring myself to refer to someone as Mafuta. Mafuta, of course, means fat. I'm not sure why, Russell, you called yourself that. Um, I don't know what those things were alarming at. Maybe a little snake or something like that. Anyway, let's carry on. They are going crazy, though, aren't they, Viam? Stop here. 
Let's just spend a couple of minutes here. Mafuta, you want to know what the vegetation's going to be like if there's not more rain by the time August rolls around because you're thinking about coming out to visit us. Mafuta, the vegetation come August, if we don't have more rain, will be fairly dire. It will be very, very sparse indeed. I think it'll be a difficult place to be. Uh, and you're thinking about coming out and you're, you're wondering if you shouldn't perhaps defer your trip to next year. Um, I wouldn't do that yet. And certainly we, as South Africans, I mean, anybody in tourism would definitely tell you that you shouldn't be doing that yet. You, even if you came out in August and the vegetation was difficult to look at, you could be very sure that despite that... There we go. Come on, old girl. Uh, sorry, did you knock your face off? You can be very sure that it'll be fascinating. Um, I, it might be less than um, easy to look at, but it will certainly be very fascinating. My foot. I wouldn't defer just yet, though. I don't know what those guys are shouting at. Anyway. Virginia and Kentucky, I see you're feeling in a comedic mood this, this morning. Um, you say that maybe I can't find any animals. Oh, hang on, this is quite interesting. Scott's got an interesting, an interesting snake for us to go and have a look at. We're going to definitely go turn around and go and have a look there. Um, Virginia, you say that the lack of animals <laughs> could perhaps be mitigated by sitting still and watching the grass grow. Virginia, I hope you're trying to be amusing. Um, I think it's a bit mean that you think that the only thing I'll be able to find is some growing grass. Look at the beautiful light as it breaks through the clouds. It's just stunning. I'm just going to call Scott quickly on the radio. Scott, I'd like to make my way there. Um, just where on Rebecca's. We'll head along to there. Scott has found a tree snake. Stunning, stunning light has suddenly broken through the clouds and bathed the low felt in golden rays. Morning sun. Very pleased that Scott managed to find me something to look at. So while we're driving there quickly, I said I see I saw a dung beetle flying past. Naturally, of course, I didn't see it with you. Uh, and naturally, of course, Sam has found a dung beetle to show you. Hello everyone, welcome back. Have a look at this. Look at this dung beetle. Yeah? Well, there's another one there as well. There's two. But he is racing with that little pile of dung. Whew. Look at him go, man. That's incredible. Go, boy. Oh. Oh. Well, so can, can anyone out there tell me what might be happening here? What is going on with these dung beetles? Are they, if you, if you can tell us, please tweet in, and uh, I'd love to know what you know. Um, dung beetles are incredible, incredible. And they are ver very, very important for ecosystems as they break down all the materials after they've been dumped <laughs> of the different various animals, mainly the, the elephants, and they will roll them up into a ball and push them. And I mean, I've watched them in some really hairy, tricky situations where they've had to push balls up some serious hills. So it's not, it's not easy being a dung beetle at times. And sometimes you actually get dung beetles that will steal another one's dung. I mean, imagine that. Imagine you've crafted your ball, took you a while, and then another dung beetle just comes and takes your, your ball while you're not watching. So it's incredible. Oh, shame. Have a look at this one here. Can you have it? Can you see him here? Yeah. 
Chevy is looks like he's upside down. That is so difficult. I'm sorry, my man. See if you can do it. You can do this. You can do this. That has to be oh oh. That has to be the most frustrating, dif difficult thing in the world. Come on, my man. You can do this. He's gonna do it. I'm gonna count him down in five, four, three, two, one. On your feet. I oh, know, shame. But it's a, this is just the way it is, Archer. Sometimes you get stuck on your back and you don't know where to climb. This is the way it works. But hopefully, and he will over time be able to get back on his feet. The problem is I would love to go and push him back over and get him up on his feet, but that doesn't teach him how to do it the next time, does it? So we actually have to wait for him to do it and learn how to get back on his feet again so that he can do it and get out of this position the next time. Everything's a learning experience in life, so. We as humans often feel like we, we want to, to get involved and, and help. Sandblaster. Well done. You got that correct. That's amazing. So they lay their eggs within the dung, as the sandblaster just told us, and, and then their babies will hatch out of the dung. So that's exactly what they're doing. Thank you very much for getting involved. I, I really like it when, uh, well, I haven't done this much, but I think it's great that you can get involved and, and help me and, and learn together out here. Because there's a lot of the things that I, I can't remember from being here quite some time ago. So to so have you guys learning with me is great. But this, oh wow, okay guys, please go to James, he's got a poem sang, that's exciting, see you later. That is incredible everybody, and I bet you can't even see what we're looking at, there it's moving now. That is a tree snake, or boom slung, found by Scott, it was crossing the road in front of his car and then went up the tree and he managed to stay with it. Let's just see if we can do the same. It's not easy, of course. There he goes. Isn't that wonderful? Look how the light's shining in his eyes. How fantastic is this? Oh, that's just magnificent. Tongue sticking in and out. Tasting the air. That's how they smell, of course. Now, just imagine trying to spot that snake in this tree if you didn't know it was there. Could you even see it? I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't see it in there. And I wonder how many times I've put my hands into a tree to climb it, and one of those snakes has kind of seen me coming and moved out the way. Now, you identify that as a worm stung by the in most enormous eyes that it has. It's able to detect the slightest movement in its prey, often chameleons. So it'll be fossicking around for chameleons, nestling birds as well. I wonder what it's seen. Look at it go. This is incredible. Your mic's cutting out. My mic's cutting out. Mm. Sorry about that. to do. Just spectacular. Watching carefully. He's right above our heads now. <laughs> so you can't see that, but he's about, he's about two feet, two and a half feet away from the vehicle, sitting almost above our heads. Now, how many Boomstung have we driven past? You <laughs> never see that. Uh, 
a question all the way from Michigan from Michelle. You want to know about is it more deadly than a spitting cobra or a black mamba? Um, it, well, its venom is more deadly, yes. This is the most venomous snake that we have in Africa. And now, what that means is that the smallest amount of that venom could kill a human being. So a smaller amount of that venom compared with black mamba venom could definitely kill a human being. But it is, it's what we call a hemotoxic snake, which means it has a, he spotted something. This is interesting. Let's keep watching him. It means that he, what the poison does or what the venom does is that it thins the blood and it stops the blood's ability to coagulate which means that you will eventually hemorrhage internally. So if you get bitten by a boom slum, you will die, but probably within about three days if you don't get medical attention. Now, the interesting thing, gee was that's a great shot, is that you do have time. So you can take time to get to medical care and you should be all right. The thing with a mamba bite is that you don't really have time. They inject massive amounts of venom and that's what makes them comparatively more dangerous. So although the venom within that boom slung is potentially more deadly, given that much less of it would kill you, you've got time to get to medical care. You would have to have a number of blood transfusions. It's, a, it's not a pleasant thing at all, but you have got time. With the mamba, you don't have long before your diaphragm will become paralyzed and you'll be unable to breathe properly. I hope that answers your question. The cobra is nothing like as venomous as either of them. Now, Barbara, you're in South Africa. As far as I'm aware, this is a male worm slung. The females are almost universally green. The males tend to be a lot more variable. So I would put this at a male worm slung. And if you look at its long tail, that would be borne out. Females will have shorter tails. That's so that there is access for mating and, of course, they have the equipment behind there to make the eggs that they will eventually lay. This is, this is the most spectacular sighting, everyone. We just don't see snakes like this in the day. Hmm. Look at his eye, huge eye. I would not like to be on the end of that thing's target radar. How big is he, Vian? Do you think he's about two feet tall? Two feet long? Be slightly longer. Do you think he's long? He's probably about three feet. Yeah, I'll go three feet. Three feet. Just about a, a meter. Three foot three to a meter. But just the muscles. And the coordination to be able to be climbing around in a tree like that are astonishing. Now that tongue is going into two holes. You can see it's a forked tongue because it's a reptile. And they go into the mouth and then into, very quickly, into two little holes at the top of the palate, which then feed into the organ that interprets whatever is on the end of the tongue. And that organ is called the organ of Jacobson. And many mammals still have one that functions. Ours is vestigial. It doesn't work as well anymore. But that's what it's using to interpret the signals coming out of the air. It looks, you know, James Bear, very good question. This looks like an egg eater, you say. Or you say, is it an egg eater or will it prey on baby birds? It'll prey on fairly large birds, James. It's not an egg eater. An egg eater has a very specific set of sort of teeth and very specific mouth and very specific digestive system. This is a standard issue carnivorous snake. It eats chameleons and it will eat nestling birds if it can find them. But I don't think it will eat eggs. Christy, you want to know what if it fell on me? 
If it fell on me, Christy, I suspect that you would hear a word that you wouldn't be, well, you would, it wouldn't be a good word to be saying on live, uh, live te television. Uh, I think there would be some very unmanly squealing, uh, followed by uh, some leaping out of the vehicle, and VM probably laughing, but that's precisely what would happen. But a snake like this is very shy. So I wouldn't be nearly as panicked as if a cobra, for example, or a mamba landed on my lap. A snake like this will do all that it can to get away. And because it is hind fanged, which means that the fangs are at the back of the mouth, it's actually quite difficult for a boomslung to bite you. It's almost got a kind of gnaw on you to get a good bite in. And I've, a friend of mine once picked up a boomslung by mistake. He thought it was a spotted bush snake. And the snake just tried to get away from him. It didn't at any stage turn, try and try and strike at him. And so if it were this highly venomous snake to land on my lap, the chances of my being bitten would be very small indeed. And you just wonder, seeing this one like that, how many there must be around the place, hunting as we speak. And Safari Dean, you're absolutely correct. The camouflage is something spectacular. So I'm going to, yeah, let's see if VM can zoom all the way out. Do you think you would see that snake? Hmm. Oh, sorry, yes. Georgianne in Illinois, I thought I might have got it wrong. You say I have got it wrong, and that the female is mostly green, and the male is, sorry, the other way around, that the male is green and the female is variable. That is absolutely correct. Thank you, Georgianne. So this would be, no, except I, mm, Georgianne, I'm worried about that because this looks like a male snake to me with that very long tail. But that said, I'm starting to have a horrible recollection in my mind that you are absolutely correct. I don't have, I don't have a reptile book with me, George Ann. That one just did have a very long tail, but I'm going to go with what you think because something in the back of my mind is saying that you're absolutely correct. Thank you for that, George Ann. Color varies, juvenile twig colored, but with bright emerald eyes and white throat, female is drab olive. Male may be mottled in black and gold, or uniform bright green. So, I'm going to, I'm going to not challenge Georgianne, agree with her, but say that I still think this is a male snake, and I'll tell you why. It says the female is drab olive, and the male may be mottled in black or gold or uniform bright green. Now this is a kind of mottled snake. You see that mottled, mottling? And the long tail, Georgian, to me is indica indicative of a male snake. The females do not have that long, thin tail. So I still think that's a male. But female, uniform, drab, brown. Drab, olive. Now, we have a question from a new viewer whose name has slipped my mind already. It's going to come through again. And your name is Ivy. Thank you for getting hold of us, Ivy. It really is very good to hear from you, especially as you're a new viewer. Please tell us where you're from next time you ask a question. And you want to know how long they can get. They're in Germany. Sorry, Ivy, you, are, you did tell us you're in Germany. A boomslung will get probably to four feet. An enormous boomslung will be about four feet long. Which is not particularly big as snakes go out here. But just the perfect size, I suppose, if you want to be in a tree like this. Mm. It's hunting, hunting, hunting. Now, Lois, you're in Buffalo, and you want me to pronounce the name of the snake slowly and to say it slowly. I should really be referring to it as a tree snake. 
So let's call it a tree snake. I have been referring to it as a wormslung. Now, wormslung is the Afrikaans term for tree snake. Worm is a tree. Slung is a snake. That's B double O M, worm. Slung, S L A N G, wormslung. And that's just because that's what we call them here. Everyone here calls them a wormslung. But a tree snake is just as correct and obviously much more universally applicable. There's that long tail. Georgian, let me know if you think that this could possibly also be a male given its mottled appearance and its very long tail. It's a magnificent creature. And of course, some of the things that people are most afraid of, some of the things that people ask the most about before they come out here or before they think about booking a trip is, can I be bitten by a snake? And of course the answer is, yes you can, but you can also be struck by lightning. And the chances of you being bitten by a snake are smaller than the chances of you being struck by lightning. So that's always a comforting thought to me, if ever I'm feeling nervous walking through the long grass. It's a bit like the fear that people have of being eaten by a great white shark. Fewer than 10 people a year get eaten by great white sharks. More than 10,000 worldwide are killed by domestic cattle. About 20,000 people a year actually die falling out of their beds in the United States, which is quite interesting. Bwumpi, at least Bwumpi. Bwumpi, I'm going to, um, I'm going to sneak forward because there's quite a nice view from where I'm sitting. Uh, this is good, yeah? Go. Yeah, beautiful shot there. Now, Brenda, very good question. I have been trying to see. You say, can I see what that snake is after? I can't, I can't see anything where he is. And he's been knocking about the tree for some time. And I don't think he, I mean, that's, that's the best place for him to rest, A, and B, it's the best place for him to lie in ambush. Now, what he's going to ambush from there, I'm not sure. He might be waiting for a, a bird to come and land there. But it's probably a question of having a bit of a rest. There's nothing at the end of the branch that he's that he's on. He does look quite alert, though. I mean, I'm not sure what a um, I'm not sure what a sleeping snake looks like, other than not, you know less sort of with his head up. But that snake does look fairly alert, although the tongue has stopped going in and out. They'll be infinitely patient, and of course, just remember that they are cold-blooded or poikleothermic, which means that they don't have to maintain body temperature, which means that they don't have to eat anything like as much as a mammal of similar size would. So he will go weeks sometimes without eating anything. Brilliant. And just as we watch him, let's just listen to a few of the sounds that have come out as the sun has joined us. Lots of drongos. Some... <laughs> some chin spot battises going... Stephen, come now. You want to know what use are snakes? What use are they? Stephen, they play a massively, massively important role in the ecology of an area like this. There are a lot of snakes here. We don't see that many of them, but they play a huge role in keeping the balance of things. They will keep the populations of rodents down. They will keep the populations of frogs down in a wet year, and without them, if all the snakes in an area were to disappear, I think you would be astonished at the proliferation of things that they eat. So the number of, increased number of birds and rodents and frogs and other reptiles would astonish you. And just to give you, this is a, 
a related but slightly different example. I was reading about swifts and swallows yesterday. I'm sure some of you have heard of the edible nest swiftlet. So that means that their nests are edible, but it's a bird called the edible nest swiftlet. And they occur in a colony of 3.5 million. Now that colony in one year devours one point, sorry, 1,800 metric tons of insects. Can you imagine, that's just in one area, can you imagine were we not to have swallows and swifts around, how many more insects there would be flying about our living rooms, uh, climbing into our ears and noses. They'd, be, they'd cover the land if we didn't have those swallows and other insect-eating birds. Now, the same thing goes for a snake like this. I know to many of you, a snake is the most terrifying thing in the world. To my mother, she wouldn't be able to watch this. She'd have to tune out and go and um, sort of fan her face outside for a while. But these snakes play an enormously important role in the ecology of an area. Everything here is part of, has a niche, and everything therefore has a role to play in the balance and the dynamic equilibrium that is the ecology of an area like this. Thank you, Stephen. All right, VMB, shall we uh, head on from this mm -hmm. magnificent slung? Look at that. <laughs> you can't see it. It's amazing. And Lucy, you're in South Bend in Indiana. And you say you can see exactly why it would be called a tree snake, because it looks exactly like a branch. It does. And a similar species, you know, called a vine snake or twig snake, uh, does the same thing. It is almost completely hidden from view in the, in the trees. It's just a bit smaller. And the other day, not the other day, a few years ago, many years ago now, I was driving along and I had some guests with the la on the Land Rover. We were following some lions off-road. And I drove under a bush like that, and I was looking through the bush, and then I thought I'd better turn and explain what was going on, and I turned around like this. And there was a twig snake or vine snake hanging from a tree just at my eye level, and a guest of mine was sitting sort of fascinated by this thing, hadn't said anything about it at all, clearly not afraid of snakes, and she had her, her finger basically in its eye, and she was saying, what's this? So to grab her hand quickly because, well, thankfully a vine snake is a bit like a worm slung. It's, uh, it's quite shy and didn't sort of lunge at her. And then we had to extricate the vehicle very carefully, of course, because there is nothing that will make people leap out of a vehicle into a lion sighting faster than a snake in the bottom of the Land Rover. I think most people I know would take their chances with lions rather than with a snake. Thank you very much, Nashna, I think it is. Um, you say that you're just giving some information on the Boomstone, which is great stuff. And you say that when, they're, when they hatch, the females are mottled, oh, sorry, are you, are sort of plain olive color, and the males are gray with blue speckles or something. I think it was blue mottles. I don't know, my comms aren't very good at the moment. Okay, so fascinating stuff. I'm going with the mail on that, Georgian, I'm afraid. Let's head across to Sam. He's got himself a large bovid. Welcome back, everyone. Have a look at the buffalo just in the, tr just in the tree thickets over here. Old, old, old man that's just been solo missioning on his own, looking for some of the greener grasses to chew on. Buffaloes for me have, have been such, a, such an interesting experience for me, learning from buff buffaloes over the last couple of years and how they just come and find solitude on their own. They're very, very, they, if we were on foot now, if, we, if all of you guys were now standing here with me, it would be a much different situation. Yeah, because we're in the vehicle. Oh, God, there's an elephant over there. Hey, Deborah, how exciting is that? We found your 
elephant. Man. Two of the big five in one quick sighting. Guys, it has been such a great morning for me. It's unreal. Thank you so much for being part of this experience. I'm just going to go quickly back to that buffalo. Look, as you can see, the buffalo is grazing over here. And it likes the, when it gets older, its teeth become a lot, lot, lot older, and it's much easier for them to go and find the rich green grasses. So you'll often find buffalo close to watering holes where the nice soft grasses where they can munch. But going also, I was saying to you how dangerous they can be on feet. Imagine you guys were standing with me right now and we weren't in a vehicle. We would have to be very, very careful because, you know, they sometimes when they see a predator now, they're so old that they don't flee, they don't run away, that they can come and attack. So they are probably the most dangerous animal to come on foot is the buffalo. So you've got to have a lot of respect for buffalo. And just over my time, in the, in the bush, I've had many, many hair-raising experiences with buffalo when I was first training. I never knew what to do. All I would see is that silhouette of that, of that horn in the distance, and I would get a very nervous feeling, just like I get quite nervous talking into a camera for the first time. But anyway, guys, let's go and follow up on that elephant. That was so exciting. We're going to quickly crawl forward silently, and um, we're going to see if, if we can spot that elephant again. Just gonna quickly see if we can see this elephant. Can you see it, Brian? Mm -hmm. We just lost track, but that's what happens when when you have a sighting of both a buffalo and a and an elephant. You can't get too excited because they will, they will leave, you know, they're not going to sit and wait for you, wait their turn to be on camera, they're going to be in and out. But at least we got to see the big elephants, and that was, wow, I've seen so much this morning, I'm so grateful. But, uh, I'm just going to go and have a quick look up road to see if we can find, find the Ellie. Myth Lynn from, was it North Carolina? Um, have I ever been to the United States was your question. No, I've never been to the United States. I've been to um, the Caribbean islands uh, quite a few years ago. That's the closest I've been to, to, to the United States. I would love to go there one day. Hopefully I get the opportunity to come and experience that beautiful country and the wilderness that surrounds it. But thank you for supporting me and saying that I'm doing well. I much appreciate it. It's been a very nerve-wracking morning for me to be in front of ca camera for the first time. Is that a roller? Is it the lilac breasted or the European? Can't see through the trees there. You can tell the difference between uh, the two different rollers. One's from a migratory bird, the European roller, and the other is the lilac-breasted roller, which is endemic to South Africa. And it is the European, the European, now that I can see it properly. And I spent some time yesterday with the European and its uh, roller, and it's incredible to see them. You know, they fly such far distances, I mean, you have to wonder whether, you know, how do they actually come all the way down here? How do they manage to fly from Europe all the way to the Southern Africa? They can't jump on a, on a flight and, and come down here. How do they know exactly where to go? It just it blows my mind, really. And, I've, you know, I was reading up on, on, on how they actually do it. And they, apparently they can, 
connects with the magnetism of the earth through their beak. And that's how they, they find their way um, from one side of the earth to the other. So it's incredible that, that animals are able to tap into the genius of this planet in order to find homes on the other side of the world. Um, I can't say that I can do that. I, I don't have any magnets on me uh, to help me get across the oceans. So, well done for traveling this far. And it's, you know, it's a, just a, a quick note on that. I mean, you'll see with a number of, with a number of birds how, how much purpose they have, you know. They, they will often, you'll see some birds, like a tern, for example, that will fly over um, a smaller bird and see that it's feeding and, and it won't look to go and feed because it knows that it needs to get to the other side. It needs to get to its, its destination. So it, it has so, such great self-realization of itself and, and, uh, and purpose because it knows that it needs to mate and collect food on the other side of the earth. So there's an intelligence of the natural world that we are still tapping in and learning so much from. And, you know, it's, it's being out in the bush and it's you looking with, through my eyes and, and through this vehicle that we can begin to uncover more of the genius of this natural world and, and learn from it and, and realize that we are not the only ones out here, that, that there's a whole world of biodiversity that, that is connected and that we're interconnected with. So let's carry on with our drive. Maybe we can see another elephant. to Debbie, you know, you were saying that, that it's amazing that one of the biggest animals on our planet can just, can just vanish. I mean, he was there with us a few seconds ago and I started talking about the buffalo. Hopefully, I was going to be able to go back to that elephant, but gone. But that's just the, the way of the world. Hopefully, we'll see another one, Debbie. We've we just need to see a giraffe, I think. I think that's the final, the final one to tick off for the morning. I've got my hopes high. And I'm just gonna start looking for that head poking out. I'm going to take a left here, eh, Brian? Yep. I'm still not sure about where I am on this reserve. I have absolutely no idea what is going on. But it's going okay. Finding myself around the darkness and through the... Ooh, what do we have on that tree there? Brian, can you manage to... Keep us from a distance. That looks like a Wahlberg's eagle. And it's... Binoculars out. What do you think, Brian? Not too sure. The main indicator that I'm getting is that crest on top of its head. If we go have a quick look at the Warburg's eagle, age 100, it has that crest. Um, if you have a look at the top of that, that that bird, there's a crest there. And over here, we have the Warburg's eagle with that crest on top, but I'm not able to make out from a far distance. Let me just see if I can, um, if I can have another look. So if any of you guys have any other doubts, please tweet in, hashtag Safari Live. Sam, I don't think that's a Wahlbergs or whatever you think it is, please let me know. I would love to be corrected. Um, we're going to try this device out just one more time to see if it works. It's going to make the sound of, a, of an eagle now.
Now that was the sound of a fish eagle, if you were able to hear that. Obviously there is no fish eagle around here. It came from this device. was a Franklin, but uh, in between the, the fish eagle and the Franklin that we had in the end there, that was the sound of the Warburg's eagle. And you know, I have absolutely no idea how this device is able to make that sound through this piece of paper. I've got to guess that it's some sort of barcode or something that is able to do something. I've had this book for two years and no one's really been able to answer that question properly for me. So if there's anyone out there that actually really knows the story behind this book, I would love to know the, the final answer. But what a, what a great, uh, great thing, because you can really, as I said earlier, get a very holistic experience of the bird and not only see the shapes and the forms, the colors of the bird, but to also understand its bird call and, and, and see what it's, or hear what it's like. Um, out in the bush. Anyway, that was a fantastic sighting of a wall bird. Safari Dean. Yes, I do have a bird list and um, I've been writing it down uh, ever since I started at London Lozy uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, it's actually at my home in Cape Town at the moment. And um, I've been, I mean, it's in this book as well. It's, it, it shows a lot of the birds from Southern Africa. But uh, over my time in England, I was able to see many, many different uh, other types of birds as well as in, in Brazil. If you can imagine the macaws and the parakeets. Oh, Brian, can you see if you can get a good shot on that? Well, guys, I think that's a good confirmation that that is a Warburg's eagle. You can see that crest quite definitively now. I'm just going to go back to that bit. Okay, guys, so that is a Warburg's eagle. How beautiful is that, is that bird? You can see the crest. It's a smallish, slender with a large gape head with a slight crest, in flight long wings with parallel front and back edges and long square tail, very visible. Usually a dark brown, but can vary, vary a great deal from light cream to brown and enjoys to perch on old dead trees. So there we have it, guys. This is exactly as the book defines it, the Warburg's eagle out in the Sabi sands. The second sighting of the morning, just like the hyena I had two, and now I've had two sightings of the Warburg's eagle. So I will never forget this day. I will cherish it for the rest of my life and I'll pay much respect to the, the hyena and the, and the Warburgs for, for welcoming me into Safari Live. All right, so, you know, just to finish off on that last question about my bird list, it's something that has been building over time uh, you know, learning about the macaws and the parakeets and tucanos to fish eagles. I'm fascinated by birds and, you know, I don't have one in particular. I don't love birds more than mammals, but I definitely have a, a strong affiliation with birds and especially bird calls. Um, I love listening to the different sounds and tunes of the birds. But otherwise, to everyone out there that has been listening and following the whole drive, Thank you so much for being part of my first experience with Safari Live. 
I must say, at the beginning, I was shaking like crazy. And there's Brian's thumb. Hello, Brian's thumb. <laughs> and I must say, in that time, thank you very much, Brian, for, for helping me along these roads. I had some, some difficulty. I must say, my nerves were shocked. But um, as the drive went on, three hours later, I'm still alive. I'm still kicking. And just a few more experiences that I've seen. On that note, thank you very much to you. And hopefully I see you soon. All the best. Well, this is a herd of Nyala over here, obviously, a very large herd of Nyala, which rather ungraciously, Vian said, demonstrates that there's a lack of leopards here. That, of course, is absolute nonsense. But I am very impressed by the size of this herd of Nyala. There are probably about 24 of them or so, just both sides of the road. And there were three bulls displaying at each other. Well, why wouldn't they in amongst the company of such beautiful ladies? Stunning, stunning. They are my favorite antelope by uh, some margin. And there are a few more coming across, and then the bulls were just down there. So let's quickly see if we can have a look at the last look at them before we close. There they are. Come on, Jigger, you old bat. Keep going. There we go. Right, uh, as we watch that magnificent bull cross the road, a big thank you to all of you for your, uh, the drive this morning. A big thanks to Sam. I think he sounds like he's had a fantastic time. That will be partly due to the wilderness here and partly due to the response that he received from you. So thank you very much. You do make this job what it is for us. The wilderness is wonderful, but it's chatting to you all the time, our marvelous viewers, that makes this job. Thank you, VM, for your efforts today. VM is very short, as you can see. He's not a particularly verbose person. Big thanks to Kirsty and Nikki in the final control. And we will see you later this afternoon at about 4 o'clock. Well, not at about 4 o'clock, at exactly 4 o'clock. And hopefully, we will find you a leopard. That's what I'm going to hope to find. Stay safe and happy wherever you are. Sleep well if you're about to go to sleep, and we'll see you in your morning. Bye-bye.